All right. So you got us. You gonna start us off? Excuse All right. Me. Welcome everybody uh, to uh, our weekly uh, Pearls of Wisdom series. This week we are focused on better together churches, uh, and we have our very own uh, Dr. Billy G. Russell. Uh, who is going to be facilitating tonight, and we have our special guest, uh, Reverend Curtis D. Young. And I just want to open us up in prayer that God be in this place tonight, God be in this discussion. Uh, so, Lord, we thank you for uh, just being who you are. Uh, God, we thank you for uh, bringing us through another day, and Lord, all of the praises and the worship that has gone forward, and the word, and the minds, and the lives that were changed due to your presence with us today, Lord. And we pray that you continue to uh, be with us in this session tonight in pearls of wisdom, Lord, as we share wisdom uh, to become better together as your bodies uh, in Christ, Lord. In your son, Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We ready to go? <laughs> you ready. All right. So welcome tonight to... Um, this Better Together series is Pearls of Wisdom as a part of Pearls of Living. It is a great honor to be here tonight um, here in beautiful Rochester, Minnesota for 21 years, sitting at this same table, 21 years. And uh, it is an honor to be here. For those who um, can hear us live, we thank you for joining us. For those who will be joining us later uh, by Facebook, we thank you for doing that. We hope um, you would do that and because this is going to be a wonderful session tonight and um, a very interesting discussion. I'm very excited, very, very excited about uh, what we have for us tonight. I, um, we've had people in the past, um, like LeBaron Hedgeman, who's written a book, uh, people like Larry Coleman, who's a songwriter, book writer, uh, people like Dr. Elliot Mallory Green, uh, who is a Greek and Hebrew professor at Faith Theological Seminary. We've had Tillis Chapman, who's um, uh, one of the top preachers in the country, who's running for uh, the National Baptist Convention president. He's already put his name in it. He is running. He's my friend, been my friend for a long time. We're honored to know him. He will be here, by the way, October 29th uh, to uh, preach Reverend Ronnie Patterson installation services. So if nothing else, if, if not for the food, you want to pay the money just to hear Dr. Tillis Chapman that's coming back here on, um, on October 29th. Um, at the, um, the the very famous Viking Lake Center, um, he would be here. So he'd been with us, and then and actually we hadn't had Dr. Jerry Young on the actual conversation with us. But Dr. Jerry Young called me, and we talked for over an hour about this particular series. He had a chance to listen to it, and we thank God for him. And he noted we're headed in the right direction. He's very thankful for what we're doing, our ministry. Everything from uh, interim pastorate to actually being there to provide services for churches. He's aware of what we're doing. We thank God for him and the conversation we had. So, Dr. Jerry Young, shout out to you. Thank you. And we look forward to talking to you real soon. Um, so, tonight we have with us um, one who I've had a chance to work with for at least the last four years, I think. Um, I, 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 I've been working with the Council of Churches uh, for eight years as I served as president of the Minnesota State Baptist Convention. And we came into a certain environment, and <clears throat> but I saw this environment change drastically uh, the last four years when I was there. And we're very honored to have this person with us tonight who is uh, very world-renowned, really. Uh, that people don't even know. He's probably the best kept secret in the world. And that is Dr. Curtis the Young. We're very happy to have him with us tonight. <clears throat> and he's um, he's actually a good friend of mine. And we we met kind of awkwardly, but um, but it's good to have you with us tonight, Dr. De Young. And I want to say that you know, um, I had a chance to preach at New Hope Baptist Church today in St. Paul. Um, had a very good time at Reverend Ronnie Patterson's 17th year anniversary, Dr. Young. Mm -hmm. Reverend mm -hmm. Patterson now is with you on the board, uh, but we I actually preached this anniversary this morning, and uh, <clears throat> and I say seventeen years, and it came about. Um, and Disha Lamar was there with us, by the way. Um, yesterday, my wife and I had a chance to go fishing. <laughs> Went to Lake Minnetonka, Black Lake, 
And uh, while I was out there fishing, the sermon I preached today came to me, mm. and I had to preach that sermon today. Um, we was out there fishing, and and let me tell you that right now, anybody wants to fish, come to Deshaun and Lamar next Friday night because we got so much fish, we're gonna have a fish fry. My wife and I called the fish. My wife right now saying, mm, "Oh, don't say that." But we caught a lot of fish in um, on Black Lake, and but what happened was we was out there fishing. And we knew the weather had already said, okay, about two o'clock, the storm is coming, rain is coming. My brother Curtis, about two o'clock, <laughs> I caught a big bass. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd already caught a lot of fish, but I caught a bass. And mm. that, I mean, that bass was like, my, my. you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, and I'm looking at the cloud, and I showed everybody the clouds. Look at that cloud, that's a storm cloud. Mm -hmm. But I said, I want to try to catch one more bass. And we stayed out there and that rain, Lord have mercy. We were way out there on the boat. Mm -hmm. That rain came. I mean, it was a storm. We got soaking wet before we got in. All because I wanted to catch one more bass. Uh, so it was my fault that we got soaking wet. But while we was on the way back in, it was storming, the wind blowing. I thought about you know, after Jesus fed the 5,000 mm -hmm. and uh, he sent the disciples away uh, and then and they went into the, into the Sea of Galilee and uh, when they was out there, a storm came yep. and Jesus, Jesus was praying and they was, they was on, the, on the boat and um, the storm came and Jesus came walking to them when the storm came and mm -hmm. uh, they thought it was a ghost and and when Peter saw Jesus coming, they, they were so afraid. So Peter said, Lord, let me come to you if it's you. Because Jesus said, it's me. Don't worry. And to make a long story short, Jesus told Peter to come. Mm -hmm. He aimed at Jesus. Yeah. But in the midst of all that, he thought about the water, thought about the waves, and he began to sink. When he started to sink, the first thing he said was, Lord, save me. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I was thinking about all of that. And then I, prepared the sermon today and I was and I told Reverend Patterson, I said, hey, it's time to think about going to the next level of faith. And so that's what Peter did. So I was thinking about that yesterday while I was fishing. And that's the sermon I preached today. And we had a wonderful time going to the next level of faith. So now Dr. Young, Dr. Young, mm -hmm. listen, going to the next level of faith, I realized that's what happened with the Council of Churches. Right. I mean you have taken the Council of Churches exactly to the next level mm -hmm. and i can say that because i've been there eight years and i've seen the total turnaround mm -hmm. in the council of churches and i want to applaud you appreciate you for people who know nothing about the council of churches and that's why i wanted you to come on tonight because you know uh maybe in the white community they know about the council of churches but a lot of people in the black community they don't know what the council of churches do so mm -hmm. that's why i wanted to bring you on tonight so you can really we, we're gonna get to that point to really, so by the time the night is over, people will understand what it is the Council of Churches are doing, what, I mean, what it has done, what it's doing, and where the Council of Churches is headed. Because certainly you have convinced me, and that's mm -hmm. been why I thought it was necessary to bring you on tonight, because you have convinced mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. So in, in convincing me, I, I, I want us to go back now to, at the beginning, I said a lot to say this. <laughs> uh, um, and trust me, th this is a, um, as Shabir said, it, it, it is, um, we usually try to do it live, but I think more people look at it on, on Facebook and, and uh, YouTube. So just know that and, uh, everything we say tonight, it will be viewed and we thank God for our viewers. Because um, mm -hmm. I talked about all the people we've had already and the things we're trying to do. All those people we've had on, we, we're gonna we're working at bringing on um, those people back on to try to do, not try to do, we're gonna do like a workshop, a series, where we have all those people come back on and, and we're going to do things that help the church to go to the next level. Mm -hmm. That's our whole goal, the next level church. Right. My whole as a pastor, as a retired pastor, is to help churches to go to the next level. Mm -hmm. I, 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 really, I really believe that the old men are for wisdom, <laughs> young men are for the war. So I want to I help train those young people, men, women, for the war that is ahead of us. And I think God has given me enough experience over the last 40 years 
uh, 40 years of pastoring and 40 years as, as in leadership position, everything from a school principal um, to teaching whatever um, in seminary uh, to be able to help people going forth in the future. And I feel like that's what God is calling me. I didn't quit preaching. I think I've gone to the next level to be able to really, really help people. So Dr. DeYoung, uh, with you here tonight, uh, it is a blessing, and we're looking forward to you coming back in the future to share other stuff with us as we do our conference going mm -hmm. forward. And one of our conferences uh, is going to be, um, my wife and I, we're celebrating 45 years. I don't know if you knew that. Wow. We're celebrating 45 wow. years of marriage. Wow. Wonderful. And we are planning right now, we're going to uh, invite couples to come with us to celebrate. You know, we, we're going to have like a, uh, a big thing it's probably going to be out of the country. We'll <laughs> let you know more about that next week. Okay. But we're going to invite couples to come with us, mm. a couple of retreat, and just mm. have a wonderful time together as, as my wife and I share what has kept us together for 45 years and, and what can keep people together for mm. 45 years, of, even mm -hmm. 50 years. So mm -hmm. um, those things, are, we, we'll talk more about that next week. But we're yeah. honored to have you and want to officially invite you tonight to share in that conference and other conferences to come. Wonderful. But Thank Dr. Leon, we met while you were the professor at Bethel. That's correct. And mm -hmm. can you talk about your tenure and what you did at Bethel and, and how, we, how, how we really came to, to be? Sure. Well, it's wonderful to be on uh, Pearls of Wisdom tonight and uh, to be with you, Dr. Russell, now as you're taking it to the next level. Uh, I had the opportunity to... Uh, uh, work with you very closely these last few years, and we'll say a little bit more about that as we get into the program. Uh, but we first met uh, when I was a professor at Bethel University building a program uh, in reconciliation studies, racial justice as a primary focus of that program. And one of my former students uh, was uh, engaged to your music minister uh, and so they invited me to, uh, to be a part of the ceremony, and it was held at Friendship, Greater Friendship, Missionary Baptist Church. And so I arrived, and you welcomed me very warmly into your office, and thus began a relationship that we had no idea was going to take us to this point of working no idea. together. <laughs> so it was sort of random, yeah, as you might say, to that first meeting, but uh, it also gave me a flavor of your ministry and your work. So when we uh, reconnected here four plus years ago, uh, I was excited by the opportunity to work with you at the Council of Churches. But you know, so you, 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 you were working at Bethel at the time and uh, it was mm -hmm. Brother David, who was my yeah. minister of music. And yep. you actually came in to help with the ceremony. Matter of fact, you did most of the ceremony because David right. told me, he said, he said, I got a professor from Bethel who, who's a, uh, this is my future wife's uh, professor who was mm -hmm. going to come help do the wedding. One of your mind, I said, no, because I'd heard mm -hmm. about Curtis the Young and the work you were doing at Bethel. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'd be honored to have Curtis the Young to come to Greater Friendship Church mm -hmm. and help participate in the wedding. And I said, I'd be just glad to meet him. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when I, had, uh, when I first got there to uh, Minnesota um, and was, at, um, was going to Bethel, I perused your classes and I, and I knew mm -hmm. your name from me and I knew, right. I knew what you was teaching. Right, and right. Um, I, was, I was going in a different direction, but I saw your class and I said, I want to get to take some some classes from, mm -hmm. from uh, Dr. Curtis DeYoung. So I had mm -hmm. seen you before I seen you. I knew your work. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I was honored to have you come to be a part of our service. And matter of fact, you did an outstanding job doing the wedding. I remember Thank that you. very vividly uh, that you are. And so from that time on, um, we didn't really see each other because I think you took a different route yeah. and kind of left and came. And so, and I was wondering, where did Dr. Young go? So what <laughs> happened after that, after our meeting at the, when you came sure. to the church? Yeah, sure. So uh, I would say one thing I, I remember about that wedding is, uh, you know, when you do a wedding in a black church, uh, you mm -hmm. can't just give a homily. You got to <laughs> actually preach the message. And so um, it was a wonderful engagement with your members and uh, one of the more memorable weddings that I've ever participated in because of the context, the setting. Uh, and that's, that, that was uh, quite amazing. But 
Yeah, shortly thereafter, I uh, left Minnesota and went to Chicago to serve at a racial justice organization in Chicago called the uh, Community Renewal Society. Uh, it's a, a legacy organization, much like the Urban League of the NAACP, except it's a faith-based legacy organization in Chicago. Um, in fact, uh, 50 years earlier, I had worked with uh, Martin Luther King when he was in Chicago. So the organization was had a rich history, and I was uh, fortunate to be invited to uh, do leadership there. And actually succeeded one of my seminary professors. Uh, and as you know, I went to seminary at Howard University's uh, School of Divinity in DC. So I was trained at an HBCU seminary. And uh, one of my professors was the uh, person who was the former executive director that I replaced. And he had been on King's staff the last couple of years and then on Reverend Jesse Jackson's staff, who we both uh, have the joy of knowing as well. And so, um, but after a, a few years there, uh, my wife was still here. We were doing one of those commuter marriages, which I would not recommend. You probably want to make that a part of your conference on marriage. You know, commuter marriage is not the best way to do this. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, we've been married a long time, so it's not like it was challenging or testing our marriage. But, you know, at this season of life, you just really like hanging out with each other. So uh, we were missing each other. And I knew that the Council of Churches, uh, I executive or CEO was nearing retirement. And so I watched the website and sure enough, uh, the announcement came and then I began to look back uh, to a return to Minnesota, which happened in uh, 2017. Well, and, and I mean, it's something to hear about your work with um, without the King and, um, and uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson and mm -hmm. going to HBCU. Can you talk a little bit more about that than your experience at, uh, sure. at Howard University? Yeah, so a little bit how that happened. Um, I was raised in Michigan in white suburbs around Kalamazoo, Michigan. So my father was a pastor, so, and my grandfather was a pastor. So I was already sort of on a track toward ministry um, and did my undergraduate uh, studies at a predominantly white Christian college in Indiana and uh, then went uh, to New York City for a year uh, to work at uh, a, a ministry there to homeless youth. And I decided to visit a church of my denomination, which is a church of God uh, based out of Indiana. And our church is about 25% uh, black, which is significant for a predominantly white denomination. Um, but I had not interacted much uh, with uh, black congregations. So I, I moved to New York didn't know my way around the city and decided to go visit one of our churches on a Sunday morning in Manhattan and unbeknownst to me was uh, headed to Harlem and so I entered a church not knowing that I was entering a uh, not only a, uh, a church in Harlem but an uh, all-black church in Harlem in fact an all-black church that hadn't seen a white person in that building in years not even one of our denominational officials and so when I came in the front door, the usher greeted me and she said, may I help you, which is an unusual greeting at a church. Um, but it was such an unexpected uh, sight to see a white person coming into the building. And I said, well, this is a church of God, right? And she said, yes. And then we had a conversation. I was welcomed very warmly. Uh, she found out that I had attended one of the denominational colleges. And so I was escorted down to the front of the church and, and it's still dawning on me that um, I'm in, I didn't even know yet that I was in Harlem, but I was dawning on me that I was in a, uh, a black church uh, and uh, much of your audience comes from the black church. So you'll understand a couple of these references, but the church was in the uh, pre-service, what they called the devotional service. Uh, the lay led portion of the Sunday service and the pastor was still back in his office and he had found out that I was there. So he sent one of the deacons out to fetch me to his office. And uh, uh, he was a, a seasoned minister and I uh, was from South Carolina. Much of the congregation was from South Carolina and it's very uh, warm uh, hospitality. But in the midst of our conversation, he sorted out that I was uh, going into the ministry uh, he'd asked me if I was a minister. I said, I'm licensed, not yet ordained, but I'm licensed. And, uh, and then for, he took his calendar out 
and said, can you preach for me two weeks from today? <laughs> I've been in the building maybe seven minutes by then, and I'm a bit in shock. I, of course, said yes, but I'd only been a youth pastor, and I'd only had a couple of sermons under my belt by then. And uh, But here was a seasoned pastor with no young ministers in his church wanting to mentor or apprentice a young minister that was there. Obviously, he saw that I was white, but what he was more interested in was how he could, you know, step into my life and help guide me along the way. And uh, so, of course, when I we left his office, he escorted me onto the platform where all the ministers in the church sat. And uh, there became the beginning of my journey uh, in the Black church. And I was there for a year. He had me preach every uh, once a month on Sunday morning. He was a man who loved his pulpit, but he was committed to uh, training me how to preach in a Black church. And his congregation uh, helped me learn how to preach. Early on, there was a lot of help him, Lord, uh, that was said from the, uh, <laughs> from the minister members. Uh, but over time, uh, I uh, adjusted, learned to uh, um, understand the context and the setting, and, and it definitely developed me into a much better preacher. And from there, uh, I had gone back to Indiana to seminary briefly and realized that I had been transformed by this New York experience, so I, I uh, needed to find a different seminary to attend. And I stopped in Washington, D.C. for a summer at another uh, Black church in our denomination. This one pastored by a Jamaican, and the church was about half Jamaican and half Black, and uh, met my wife at that congregation and uh, decided I wanted to go to seminary in D.C. since I had met my wife. And of course, I'm at a black church in Washington, D.C., so they're going to take me over to Howard University because that's the seminary that they uh, have graduated from, many of them. And uh, that's how I ended up uh, doing my uh, graduate seminary work uh, at Howard University. Um, and it certainly transformed uh, the way I think uh, about the Bible, the way I think about racial justice, and the way I live my life. Wow. It started with a black pastor in, in New York. Yep. <laughs> that uh, saw a white person come to this church. And uh, you get the word that here's a white preacher in my church. And I'm a, I'm gonna help him learn how to preach to black black folks. <laughs> how, did, yeah. how did you do with the, the call and response initially? Because you know it, it's kind of different. I know you preach in the white churches and yeah, and, and I've I've had a chance to preach in black and white and uh, all the other kinds, mm -hmm. but um the call and response in the black church is different. How, how did you react to that? Because I had one of my preaching professors from New Orleans Seminary to come preach for me one time. And and because he was telling me all about preaching. But when he came preaching mm -hmm. in a black church, the call and response got it. It shook him <laughs> up. So how did that and he, uh, and he and he didn't he didn't do so well. So so, so how, how did right. you handle that? Well you gotta learn to slow down. You gotta <laughs> okay. understand that the sermon is not a monologue but it's a dialogue. And so once I understood those two things and how to become more, uh, uh, allow the spirit to engage in the preaching. Uh, so, uh, so I would had to become uh, more relaxed and more open and let the congregation maybe even take me some directions I hadn't imagined that I would go in the sermon. And uh, you know, it's, there's nothing like getting that immediate affirmation um, but folks will also correct you if uh, you think you're headed <laughs> off in a direction you shouldn't be going. So you got to receive that as well. But they were a loving uh, group and the pastor, of course, I could watch him and learn from him and, and his preaching style. And uh, yeah, so I just acclimated to the context, I guess. Well, you know what, and I can, I can um, say that you came to Greater Friendship and you preached the, the week leading up to the, when we had the National Baptist Convention here. Right. Matter of fact, you were the first sermon leading up to the National Baptist Convention. During that National Baptist Convention week, right. I asked Curtis Young to come preach on our theme. And the theme was, we are better together. And that's the theme was, was adopted uh, by the state and also nationally. And man, that sermon, you preached that Sunday. I mean, you didn't let the call and response affect you at all. You went right on and just delivered a great message. Amen. And, it, and it's probably one of the uh, one of my favorite sermons on, on Better Together yet. Amen. And my wife has used it. I've used it, uh, different excerpts from it. So I want to appreciate you for that. 
-hmm. and just know we're using your sermon. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. glad about, but no, knowing that we're using your sermon, I think it's important at this point to realize, and and what we're doing tonight, you all is totally unscripted. Curtis and I didn't even really realize what we what we hit tonight. We're just thanking <laughs> God for our opportunity together. Right. Um, but I I was checking you out, and, and when I was looking at the the Better Together message, and I and I just read it just last week, mm. and. And, and and thank you for sending me the whole script. I got the whole script on Better Together. So if anybody want a good sermon on Better Together, I got it. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> anyway, um, you have written a lot of books, and I mean, and it was it was evident in that presentation in that sermon. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about? I mean, how many books you've written, and 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 and, and you are people don't realize this that right in Minneapolis we have a national renowned speaker and I'm, I'm just happy to know somebody like you but i say i know a national speaker that's known all over the, all over the world and that's that, that people are inquiring about him all over the world come speak at my conference so mm -hmm. i know curtis young so talk to us about some of the things you're doing i mean with your books and your workshops you're doing across the country right now and especially now uh doing this racial justice time sure so yeah i've had the honor to write or edit or co-write or co-edit several books um, it really started at, uh, at Howard University because I, I was, uh, a, in similar ways to what happened in DC, a couple of the professors there really took me under their wing and kind of schooled me uh, in this work. And one in particular uh, was Dr. Kane Hope Felder, who uh, at the time was noted for his Afrocentric interpretation of the Bible. And uh, in fact, he developed the uh, African uh, heritage Bible that has been used by many folks, which points out clearly the uh, black presence and the African presence in the scriptures. And what I took from that was um, if that's what, if, if, if folks at Howard, uh, scholars, uh, black scholars, African scholars are reading the Bible through that lens, they're seeing things that the rest of us are missing because we don't have that lens. And I assumed that probably was happening in other racial cultural groups. So I began to read very widely. And so even my first book was a look at um, how to interpret the Bible in a culturally diverse context. But for instance, when I was at Howard University, I learned that there are 850 references to Africans and African places in the Bible. Now, how could anyone ever say that the Bible is the white man's document if they knew there are 850 references? Well, the Bible has been co-opted, of course, and colonized and used to support white supremacy. But the Bible itself, if you look at it and you have the right lens and you pull out the maps and see where these places are, you'll see that this was a, a, a document, a scripture, they came out of mostly Africa and Asia. There are very, actually very few references to Europeans and white people. And you mostly only find those in the New Testament. And those are mostly Romans and Greeks. Uh, and because uh, the early church lived under the Roman Empire, they were an oppressed, colonized people. So, I mean, when you begin to understand that, that affects. So that has affected and what kind of launched my writing. And then I was sort of like, now that you know this, what how does that need to affect the church? And so it's helped me understand uh, more about uh, reconciliation as a something we might pursue, racial justice, uh, looking at diversity in congregations. Uh, so I've taken this a number of ways, but it all kind of comes back to that uh, original uh, understanding of the Bible coming from that Howard University sort of read. And I mean, I think that's something that HBCUs and certainly HBCU seminaries really offer that's, that's unique and has not, for some reason, found its way over to many other locations. Wow. And, the, and you eight, at least eight books and uh, co-authored other books yep. and edited other books. I mean, and, and along that perspective, that, that's amazing. And I, want, and I want to say thank you. Thank you for doing yeah. that. Thank you for admitting that. Uh, mm -hmm. for, for saying it like you did, and a lot of people need to hear that. Well, how how did that um, that you're coming up in the HBCUs and, um, and you're preaching in, in a lot of black churches? 
and all of a sudden we look around and you're coming back to coming back to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And you're coming to, I don't want to just say white council churches, but that's basically what it was. And yeah. Yeah. And, and and how did you, I mean, I mean, want to come to an organization like that? Because I was, because you, you know, the, the, the Baptist Convention has always worked with the council churches, uh, but then we had a big divide right. uh, between uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend Bethel and Reverend McAfee and uh, because of really some racist kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, a lot, and a lot of people in the, um, in the black community considered the council churches as being just sort of a racist religious organization. Mm -hmm. But somehow or another, you have come through and uh, you've changed all that. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the things that you've done. And by the way, everybody, this is Curtis Young. He is the president and CEO of the Council of Churches. And, and, and I'm honored to interview him tonight. So talk to us about what you've done and what you're doing going forth to make that, to make that look different. Sure. So I should first say that, of course, you know, I had been in Minnesota for a number of years. So I had developed a lot of relationships, you included of folks that I knew. Um, when I went to Chicago for a few years, uh, that was a powerful experience in kind of refocusing and reshaping uh, what I think has been God's call on my life around racial justice. I think I'd actually gotten a little soft here in Minnesota. You know, I've been in New York, DC, uh, but I've been a long time in Minnesota and I think I got kind of soft. And so, you know, in Chicago, they <laughs> they don't play in Chicago. So no. it is uh, like, you know, people were direct, focused. It also reimmersed me uh, into the Black church because our organization's uh, base was in the south and west sides of Chicago, which is uh, where the uh, majority of the Black uh, neighborhoods are. And so I got rerouted re in the Black church in Chicago. And then the organization that I was working with was a racial justice organization and had been one for, for many years, but its board was majority white. And I said, how does this, how do you do this in Chicago when Chicago is two thirds persons of color? And so that, uh, I learned something in that because we transitioned the board. I refused to come unless they would change the board to reflect the demographics of Chicago. And then I realized that um, the board of an organization really owns the organization. They're like the owners. Uh, mm. So if you want a black led organization, that's good. They'd had that for 25 years. What you want is a black owned or person of color owned organization to support leadership of color in other roles and positions. But that's where real transformation came. So when I came back to Minnesota, I, I will admit that one of the things, in addition to getting back here where my wife was living, uh, the other appeal was that the Minnesota Council of Churches seemed like a place where there was a real opportunity to create some change. So even in the interview process, uh, I um, was very uh, right up front about what I thought needed to happen. Uh, I didn't know how it happened, but what I thought needed to happen and uh, and they still hired me. Uh, I was uh, the the organization was definitely very much majority white. The board was under the leadership of white leadership, and and that's the history of the organization. So that's not a surprise. The four uh, historic black denominations that are here in Minnesota had all become members by then, uh, with uh, Bishop Howell being the last uh, to join. Um, and Bishop Washington was on, of the Church of God in Christ was on the interview committee. Um, but uh, an interesting thing happened uh, just a month after I started on the job. Those white supremacists in Charlottesville went crazy and all that publicity and the heads of the black denominations, uh, yourself included, said, we wanna to talk to uh, our white counterparts, the white bishops. And so we convened a conversation uh, at Shiloh Temple, a really heart-to-heart -heart conversation about racism. Mm -hmm. And when the whites uh, leadership did not run away or leave the table, I said, we might have the possibility for some change to happen. And then as you'll remember, I met with the four leaders of the black denominations to say, hey, I think we can do some change. But you're all in such demand. I mean, this is a, a really overwhelmingly white context, Minnesota. And so everybody wants you a part of their committees. Um, but you all said, 
um, yeah, let's let's make this happen. And I think part of it was that I'd had, you know, relationships. I mean, I've known Reverend McAfee for over 30 years and he, Reverend Bethel for as long and uh, many other, uh, Reverend Richard Coleman from the AME. I mean, I've known several of uh, the leadership in the black church for many years. So that helped because people knew, knew me. Uh, people have always given me a break in the black community because I, I was trained at an HBCU. Basically the essence is, well, he must know something if he was there for three years. And so that gives me uh, an open door usually to have some conversations. And so then we began to move forward. And the first thing we did, you as you came into the presidency of the board of directors at the council of churches, always had been uh, president. If they had a black president, you'd have a white vice president. We decided we're gonna have a black vice president and the vice president then succeeds the president, and then we're gonna put the leadership in the hands of the black denominations, the heads of the black denominations. And very quickly, the executive committee became majority black. And then our governance committees became majority black. And so the folks handling the agenda of the organization and setting up what was going to be discussed, what was the vision, and now uh, we're all members of Black denominations, the heads of the Black denominations. And that really changed the feel of the organization. Um, and so that was the first step. Uh, of course, in, uh, we had done that and we were already in that process. Uh, and then George Floyd is killed here. And uh, so I'm glad we were already in the process. Um, we were already preparing for something of that magnitude, even though we didn't know it was coming. And, uh, and after that, we decided we just got to go all the way in. And so we changed our bylaws to expand uh, the number of board members we had to, and put it in the bylaws to guarantee that the Minnesota Council of Churches board will always be a majority from black, indigenous, and person of color communities. Therefore, whites will always be in the minority on the board. And remember what I said earlier, it's the board that owns the organization. So yep. you initials people like to use now BIPOC. We have a yep. BIPOC majority board written into the very structures and bylaws of the organization. Well, that, that, and, and it took courage to do that, Curtis. And it took courage, and, and I was and I was concerned. I didn't know how the white community was going to receive that. Yeah. You know, you know yeah. and you know I was always supportive of, of you doing that, but I didn't know how you're going to be received. And and, they, and since that time, you've gone and even hired two people to right. make sure that these things happen. So yep. can you talk about that and, and how the, the white community has received this and what you're doing and has the, the, um, sure. um, the, 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 the help fallen off any other, they supported you, the white community. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, we have to admit the way race plays. And so the yes. fact that I'm white, probably gives me a bit of an advantage in talking to the white leadership. Um, and, uh, but also I think a number of them uh, wanted to see, are actually well-meaning folks that wanted to do the work of racial justice and racial equity, um, but are not always sure how to do it in their majority white denominations. So if the Council of Churches could give this a try, that gives them a chance to kind of see how it might, might happen. And then, as I mentioned, George, as I said, George Floyd was killed. And uh, within a, a week or so, there was a large clergy march. You were part of that. Um, and uh, Elder Stacy Smith, who's now our board president, was one of the organizers of that. And a thousand clergy, both in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And then it was like, and now what? What is the role of the church? What should the mm -hmm. Minnesota Council of Churches be doing? And interestingly enough, a few of the bishops of our larger white denominations had a phone call with each other and with that kind of idea, what should the council of churches be doing long-term around racial justice? And they mentioned reparations. And then they brought me on the phone and I basically said, do you know what that word means? <laughs> do you know what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because reparations cost white people something. It's going to cost us as in cost us as individuals and it cost us as organizations, cost in that case as denominations. So I said, we got to like bring this to the executive committee, which is majority black. You were in leadership as our president at that time. 
And uh, black pastors at that time were very tired from uh, the intensity of those early few weeks after George Floyd's death and, you know, probably didn't get hardly any sleep and uh, being called to do press conferences, to host national folks that were in, as well as all, everything that was happening in the community because, uh, you know, the, the pharmacies, the grocery stores, et cetera, were all bombed out and closed and even the churches were under threat. And so, um, but yet after, it took us three executive committee meetings and I've always liked to frame it as like, first off, black leadership is tired. Second, black leadership wants to know, can we trust the white folk? Mm -hmm. And that they really know what they're talking about and they really mean this. And third, should we give this a chance? And by the time the third meeting, uh, we decided to give it a chance. And what we did is we knew that reparations is a very politicized term. So we shaped a process, a three-point plan that said we want to do truth telling, education, because we know white churches are going to need education to understand how to talk about race. Um, and all of us are going to need it, you know, at some level to talk with each other. And then reparations. And so we hired two staff people, one from, we decided to do this both in native communities and African-American communities. So we hired a, a minister from each community to take the lead on this racial justice work. Uh, along with me, and I'm doing a lot of the fundraising for the work to keep them paid to do this and to begin, which we did just, uh, I guess it's a week ago now, launched the truth telling process. We have been trying to set up the education and, uh, but the end of the game, this has to lead to reparations to really be seen as a success. And, uh, and we don't back away from, that means money, that means wealth transfer in black communities, that might mean land and culture and also economic realities in native communities. But we also see it as a bigger thing as well, that from a theological perspective, as people of faith, we need to repair the harm that's occurred from racism historically in Minnesota and continues to occur because of the systems in place. Why do we have the worst racial disparities in the country? It's because of all the harm that's happened because of a white supremacist system in place. And so we got to understand that, get at that, try to fix it. And then we have to also simultaneously address the effects in communities. And we, as a council of churches, cannot say what those reparations should look like or how they should be delivered. The black community, the native community have to, to say, this is what we need. This is how we need to receive it. So that's where I think the black church becomes incredibly important in the work of reparations um, is that they have the trust of the community. I mean, just recently with the uh, 21 days of peace addressing violence, it's such a uh, clear example of how much communities trust the church in black neighborhoods um, and how important they still remain. Well, thank you so much. Now, you know, and I, I wanna appreciate you for, for that work and I, I guess when, when I saw you at a uh, at Pilgrim at a stair step meeting uh, uh, was last week, uh, yeah, maybe a week, couple weeks, week yeah. and a half ago, and I, I was appreciative to see you there because I know the work we tried to do to make sure that we are better together with uh, mm -hmm. Council Church and stair step. So to see yeah. you there uh, was very encouraging. So I, I guess overall, I guess, I guess I can ask you, but um, with the people you've hired and the things you're doing. Um, How's it going today? I mean, I, is, is, is that is it proceeding in the right direction? You think or, when you're moving forward with the relationships? Yeah, I think we have a good start, but it's a long journey. So we have committed uh, a minimum of 10 years for this initiative, and it may take longer. It may have to be passed on to my successor. Uh, you and I share the same birthday a year apart. So you, you know that, uh, you know, there's so many days left in my journey. Um, and that's up to God, of course. But uh, we have to build this from the beginning strong enough to, to be able to go through maybe a, a few generations of leadership because the, the harm of racism happened over so many generations. Undoing it's going to take time. But I do think we've made a good start on the truth-telling process. 
I think that we're beginning to uh, put together some educational initiatives, which I think will be really helpful, particularly in uh, white congregations. And then we're building the relationships that will be necessary to address reparations. Because council churches can't, this is not just something we do by ourselves. I mean, this is a big lift, this is a huge lift. So yep. we got to partner all kinds of ways. And some exciting things have happened uh, after George Floyd's death, if we can sustain them. Black business leaders are much more out in the forefront now and asking for what they need. Uh, foundations are uh, committing to racial justice. So let's just hope that continues for the long term and it's not just a fad. Um, government is trying to figure out how to, how to engage in, in this. Um, reparations though still is a bit scary for folks, but um, if we're gonna really, really see change. And I, I think that the way we'll know that we've been successful is when we see those education gaps based on race, those wealth gaps, those housing gaps begin to decrease and decrease and decrease. I think that, you know, it's not gonna be enough to have done this for 10 years and say, look at what we've done. We're gonna have to actually be able to show in hard statistics that things have improved to call this a success. Amen. Thank you. Well, listen, we got and our talk go on and on. I, yeah, yeah. An hour is not enough for us tonight, but um, I I think I want to. We got about ten minutes. And I want to close okay. out by doing this by saying, I mean, about all the books that you've written. I mean, maybe you could say something about how people can get those books or what you know. If you we got maybe something you want to share on the screen or, uh, the main thing is just kind of that that was in one of the books, you took um. Pentecost, mm -hmm. and somehow you connected that with racial justice, and so if you, and, and I know you don't have time to do the whole mess. You just kind of <laughs> talk about that kind of where people ever type they want to go get that book. Sure, sure. So all my books are on Amazon, so you can just uh, put my name into Amazon, and they'll they'll come up. Um, I think there's a few books in particular that I would suggest, given what we've discussed tonight. One is a book, which was my first book, and then it was revived 15 years later called uh, Coming Together in the 21st Century, uh, the Bible's uh, the Diversity in uh, the Bible in an Age of Diversity. And uh, I was on Judson Press, uh, so Baptists know Judson Press. And uh, that really gives a good uh, foundation for the kind of multicultural aspects of the Bible and how we read the Bible, how the Bible comes out of a culturally diverse context. And it, and you know, talking about the black presence in the Bible or the Asian presence in the Bible, I demonstrate that. Um, another book I would suggest uh, is called Radical Reconciliation. And it, uh, I co-wrote that with a South African by the name of Alan Busak, who was- very, I read that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that because it gives us a, um, a much stronger definition of reconciliation than what's typically used. If you think about it, the people who wrote Apostle Paul, Peter, the early uh, generation of the church, first century church, they were all people who were colonized. They were under Roman uh, supremacy kind of perspectives. Um, and they were the ones that were using the language of reconciliation. So it is not a soft term like many people have suggested. It's actually a radical term and it's very social justice infused. So we lay that out in, in, in that book. So I would I'd recommend uh, those two books in particular. Um, also, the People's Bible is a multicultural Bible that really does some good work around this. If you go on Amazon today, it, it's gonna say it's out of print. But go back in two or three weeks and there's a new printing coming out and it will be available again. And uh, so uh, I, would, I would encourage that. And it's just a beautifully done book, has new visuals, has images of Jesus, black images of Jesus and shows some of the white images that have been mis that have misused for the image of Jesus. And it has a map. One of the things that you can hardly find in a Bible is a map that includes Africa. Uh, so many biblical maps, they might show a little bit of Egypt, but they don't take you clear into Ethiopia and Sudan and, you know, where the Garden of Eden started. And uh, much of the Bible takes place in Africa. So we, we, had, we, had to, we had to commission a new map for the Bible 
to actually get all of the biblical locations uh, on a map. Uh, so wow. that's in that Bible as well, the People's Bible, it's called. And there are five of us that were editors, five different races and cultures uh, together uh, working on that. Um, the newest book I wrote is one called Becoming Like Creoles. Um, and uh, that I wrote with a team of people. And we, we look at, use the metaphor of Creole because it's a multiracial idea of people becoming in multi-race or Creole. But if you look at the Creole metaphor, it always occurs uh, under colonialism or oppression. So I was looking for something that could talk about unity and justice. And so that's what we do in that book. And of course I use Pentecost as sort of a, a centerpiece of starting uh, in that book um, as well. Um, in the few minutes that are left, I just want to say that one of the things that I think is so important is uh, for the preachers and the teachers and the students of the Bible in the audience is to um, really have the right resources to interpret the Bible. I think it was, it was two or three weeks ago, your guest, Dr. Elliot Malroy Green, uh, amazing scholar of Hebrew and Greek and linguistics and talked about understanding what the words meant in the first century, what it meant when the King James Version was uh, translating those manuscripts and what they mean today and how language changes. So it's so important to get back to the original meaning. I would say a similar thing is to understand what the culture uh, was like when the Bible was wrote, written, the context, the so the, kind of the sociology of the reality. And so um, if you have those tools, uh, that will help you have a better ability to apply it today um, and interpret it for uh, your own uh, benefit in Bible study, but or for your congregation if you're a preacher. And uh, Pentecost, uh, uh, very quickly, we always see that as a unity passage, a better together passage, and it is. It's all that. But when you look at it, it's a group of Jewish folks from different contexts, Galilean Jews, Jews from the diaspora, Jews that have been in different countries that have either moved back to Jerusalem or are visiting for the Pentecost, and then a few others um, under the auspices of a Roman Empire. So these are both basically oppressed folks, at, and Jesus has been ministering three years in the Jewish <clears throat> community, trying to build the church, which is now about to be launched, and Pentecost launches that church. So kind of the first thing is I read Pentecost because I see several Pentecosts. There's the Pentecost of Acts 2. There's the Samaritan Pentecost in chapter 8 and on and on. I'll, I'll just note a couple others quickly. But what happens in that first Pentecost is the healing work that needed to be done in the Jewish community that was fragmented under colonialism and oppression and what we call racism today. So if I were to translate this into a Black context, I would say these are folks living in Black neighborhoods, Galileans, folks, Black folks living in the suburbs uh, who have been in white contexts a lot, and they're brought together to help unify because then the next step was going to go into Samaria, and the Holy Spirit comes to Samaria, and Samaria would be kind of like Native American folks today and black folks who have historically been pitted against each other uh, now happen to resolve. And then the third act of Pentecost uh, comes at the Roman centurion's home. And that's where the white people come in. Cornelius, he's a white guy. And Peter sent to go, in fact, Peter, God had to give Peter a vision because Peter was so against going to his oppressor and he's a Roman centurion for all things. He's like a police officer, a Roman. He's like a police officer for the Roman. He, his job was to keep Peter's oppression in place. But Peter goes, the Holy Spirit falls. Cornelius is transformed. He invites uh, Peter and his team to stay overnight. So you, you watch this. And so at each moment, you've got unity, but you also got the leveling of the playing field. You've got an equity, a social justice happening. You've got the dismantling of the power and privilege, privilege systems that are in place. Tucked in there, we don't want to miss this, Philip meets the Ethiopian, who's a finance minister for Queen Candace in Nubia. 
So high profile, high level, that was Rome's rival was Nubia or Kush or Ethiopia. Um, and so already outside of just the kind of, this thing just starts to just to go. And then as the first century church unveils, you see that Paul always, you see this throughout Acts. So I think Pentecost is happening all the way through the book of Acts. You see Paul go first to Jewish communities. I always wonder, why do you go first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles? He went first to the Jewish communities to establish and do the reconciliation and healing work that needed to happen to communities that were under colonialism and racism. And once they're in the process of healing, they go, well, if God can do this for us, maybe God can do it for Romans and for Greeks. Or today we say, maybe God could do it for white people. <laughs> and so we begin to see this amazing thing happen. Uh, and But what happened there, that the first century churches were always in the homes of Jewish people. Their churches were at homes and they were Jewish people, the homes of Jewish people. So Romans and Greeks who never went into the homes of Jewish people went there for church. And by going into those homes, they had to set aside all their privilege and they came out, changed people. And they sat under the leadership of Jewish preachers and teachers. And if you look across the New Testament, in that first generation of leadership, every pastor that I can find and locate as a pastor is Jewish, oppressed. So just to put that into today's language as we close, it would be like Jesus came to the black community. Black Jesus came to the black community and did the healing work that was needed because of generations of experiencing racism. And then when folks were getting healed, they said, maybe this same Jesus and the same healing can help those folks who have either oppressed us or benefited from that oppression, white people. And those white people then came into the black churches that Jesus had started and were under the leadership of black pastors in this healing process. That's bluntly, that's really what was happening in the first century. So often when we think about multiracial churches, we think it's like people of color going to a white church. That's just the opposite of what was happening in the first century. So anyway, when you have those kind of resources and tools to look at the scriptures, amazing things show up. Well, stop right there. because that, I want you to pick up right there, and that's where your workshop will be going to start. Amen. We're going to do the next level church workshop, and I'm telling everybody right now, Curtis the Young is going to be a part of that workshop, <laughs> and it's going to be amazing. And he's going to talk about that experience right there. I wanted him to whet your appetite tonight so you can see that we have a great, great man before us. And thank God for you, Curtis, and what Amen. the work you're doing at Council of Churches. And we're going to be working with you in the future to make sure Amen. that the work continues. So thank you for coming on tonight. And I'll, I'll be in touch. I'm going to call you next week to let you know great. how this thank goes. You. Thank so you anybody got any questions come in, please put them in the chat and we'll get back with you on it. And, um, but uh, thank you all for joining us tonight, and we'll look forward to seeing you on, on next Sunday. And uh, Curtis will be back real soon. God Amen. bless you. Thank all. you. God bless. Thank you all. God bless you.